Welcome to the Bioinformatics CRO podcast. I'm Grant Belgard, and joining me today is Adam Marblestone. Adam, can you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Hi, Grant. I'm a Schmidt Futures Innovation Fellow, working on trying to roadmap and galvanize funding for new medium scale moonshot science projects. And previously, I've done a bunch of research in, in a few different fields, many of them connected to neuroscience in some way, a bit on neuroscience inspired AI, a bit on brain computer interfaces, and earlier some work on uh, molecular biology tools and imaging tools for the brain. Thanks. And I'd really like to, to get to some of your older work, but first let's start out with FROs. What are they? The basic observation behind FROs is that there's a class of problem that is not a great fit either for academia or for startups. And the reason why academia struggles with this type of problem is if it requires a, a certain level of concerted organization and scale of an effort beyond a, let's say, a handful of people tightly working together. So an example of this is recently uh, DeepMind's recent work on protein folding where you have 18 co-first authors on one paper. And that would be very unusual in academia because in the end, everybody has to have their own thesis or their own postdoc or so on. And so you do have people in academia who very much want to collaborate and can be very good at it. But from an incentive perspective, it's hard to get, say, 20 or 30 people working in a tight-knit engineering organization for, let's say, five or seven years to build something, a really complicated integrated system. And on the other hand, in startups, it is very possible to do that. But by, by the time you'd be five or seven years in, you really need a very clear path to revenue and, and product market fit. And often um, for a fundamental, if you want basic science platform, that wouldn't be a good fit. So FROs are simply an attempt to get both the government and philanthropists to fund dedicated nonprofit organizations to tackle this class of problem. How do you see this as different from what, what came before? Well, I think there are definitely hints of this. And in some ways, we're just drawing attention to the need for, for more of this. I would say projects like Genelia Farm Research Campus doing a, a fly connectome or the Allen Mouse Brain Atlas, some projects that institutes like the Broad or Sanger Institute, they, there are certainly concerted projects. And there's also examples that are much larger, like, like the, the Genome Project was maybe $3 billion or so. And the way we envision focused research organizations is 30 to 50 uh, times smaller than that, roughly. So t tens to, to, to hundreds of millions rather than billions, enough that you would meaningfully change the incentives and organizational structure and path of a field, but not necessarily have to put, put billions into a single project. So I think that really the observation is just that there's more need for these type of model than is being satisfied by the existing mechanisms and that it is possible to systematically go and try to identify what those are and push on them. And what fields and projects do you think would be the best candidates for an FRO? Well, that's part of what we're trying to figure out now. We're going around to the scientific community pretty broadly and asking people, what would you do if you were not only not limited by funding, but also not limited by sort of structural affordances? Like imagine that you could take your a research program that you want to do and spend four or five years doing that as an FRO with the optimal resources and then spin off several companies and then, you know, incorporate that back into universities or government labs. So we're going around pretty widely. I think there are a few different categories of FRO that do emerge from that. One is where you have to build a prototype system that just involves a lot of complicated working parts, but is directed toward some kind of basic science problem. So the classic example I always use of this is, uh, next-gen connectomic brain mapping. So normally with brain mapping at the finest resolution where you can actually see connections between individual neurons, you 
are dealing with the electron microscope, which is the highest resolution microscope that there is. And you need that because the way you're labeling the neurons is you're just saying any given pixel is either black or white, basically, or grayscale. Is this the membrane of the cell or is this not the membrane of the cell? Mm -hmm. And then you have to image that very, very finely and then try to reconstruct the shapes and connections of all the neurons from that very high resolution, but at some sense limited data, which is just membrane or non-membrane. Now, with optical microscopes, you can get much more information out of any given pixel. You can, first of all, have several colors, but more importantly, you can image the same spot many times because the light is not destructive and you could flow on different chemicals and reagents. So you can get a huge amount of information out of any one spot, but the resolution of optical microscopes is slightly lower. You can overcome that with new chemistries like expansion microscopy, uh, which moves the molecules apart from each other so that they're they're more easy to resolve and with fancy microscopes and instrumentation that can can boost that a bit so if you wanted to make a brain mapping technology or generally a biological tissue mapping technology based on this where you can see lots of molecules and adapt this to be able to actually see neural connections you just have to put a lot of pieces together you have to put multiple types of chemistry multiple types of biology multiple types of engineering and instrumentation and it's just a complex kind of building out that prototype system. Once you have that, scaling it is also ch challenging, but it's a slightly, slightly different problem. So that, that's an example where you're building a prototype and you also see things like that in completely different fields. Like you can imagine making the first drill that can drill down into very you know, high temperature rock for fine geothermal energy sources or something like that. It's a completely different field that similarly kind of need to integrate you know, high temperature electronics from NASA with drills from the oil industry and geochemists or things like that. So that's a prototyping FRO. I think another category, something is more like a foundry where in general, there is some ability to do something already to produce some kind of artifact already, but it's not reliable enough and systematic enough that end users have access to it. So this is maybe closer to things that companies would do, but in, in some cases, the resource that you want to produce should be some kind of public good and or it's deeply pre-commercial in the sense of the application space is not yet known. So we see this in several areas of nanotechnology or nanofabrication, where, for example, with sort of the next generation of 3D integrated chips, like conventional chips, you basically have layers of sort of silicon metal insulator uh, on, a, on a flat surface. But what you might want to do in the future is have things like layers of carbon nanotubes and very deep three-dimensional you know, interconnects between these different layers, so very densely integrated in 3D with lower energy switches. And you know, that's something that requires you to go beyond the kind of foundry environment that Intel or TSMC or these other companies where you can order chips from already have. So you need to build a foundry for that. At the same time, it's not clear exactly what the application is yet because you would have to figure out what kind of software and compilers and all sorts of other things you would make for that. So you actually need a foundry just to be able to discover applications, let alone actually sell something. So that's that's an example of FRO for a foundry. And we, we see that with a, a bunch of different areas of nanofabrication. And then I think a final category, although this, this is not an exhaustive list, would be something like an observatory. Um, which is a little bit more similar to the Human Genome Project, where you just need to collect a data set in a very unified way. Maybe you have existing technology. Maybe like the Allen Institutes, yeah. Yes, I think the Allen Institute, you know, m m many existing institutes, I think, do something that's, that's more like this. They take a, a relatively mature set of technologies and they just integrate the data. They just create a more unified way of collecting and, and accessing that data. I see a lot of need for that in some fields of sort of disease biology and kind of in vivo biology, like where a lot of the existing institutes that do the data collection at this scale actually are focusing mostly on the normal state. One example of this would be human brain tissue um, doing really deep proteomics, maybe even single cell level proteomics of human brain tissue samples. Another example would be in the, in the field of aging or geroscience, there is a bunch of interventions, putative interventions that have emerged, including one that was recently on the cover of Nature, you know, claiming to have ways of basically reversing aspects of the aging process. And this is pretty amazing. But often different papers 
and labs in this field measured completely different things when they apply those interventions. You know, so one lab will have a relatively small number of mice and they'll measure a few properties, but maybe not the lifespan or maybe not methylation clocks in the blood that, that are supposed to be predictive of the rate of aging. Another lab will measure the meth- methylation clock, but you know, not measure cardiac function or something like that. And so how do you have a really unified basis on which to compare and combine these anti-aging type interventions? That would be an example of a kind of observatory I think you could build where you would really systematically uh, look at the, the phenotypic effects of, of aging and uh, interventions against aging. Yeah. Very cool. So if you could direct a hundred million dollars to a specific FRO today on this podcast, you had to choose in the next <laughs> minute, uh, what would the topic be? Yeah, it's hard to choose one. That's part of why, you know, I, I think we want to create a, a, a so like, like wait, wait, which of your children do you love the most? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you can't answer it. I mean, I, th- I think that there are different ones that are appealing for different reasons. I think some are appealing because they they so clearly fit the FRO category, like they're so clearly not doable in, in some other way. Others are perhaps more appealing because of the kind of near-term impact that they would have or the, the kind of clarity of the path to, to impact. I think, yeah, we want to really add to the vocabulary of government and philanthropy this as a, a more repeatable model to be used and complementary to lo- lots of other ones, including sort of the ARPA or DARPA model, which is a bit more um, discovery oriented and yet also aims for a certain degree of scale or concertedness of efforts. Yeah, I mean, per- personally, you know, I have some long term interest in, in the brain mapping one I mentioned, but but that's, I think, just one example. Yeah. So what would be the ideal outcome of your current position? What would, what would constitute success? Well, I think if we could get philanthropists excited about essentially wanting to kind of own topics this way. So if you have someone who's really interested in antibiotics, then perhaps in addition to supporting a diverse set of research about antibiotics or investing in companies that are have antibiotics near to the markets, they would say, you know, the, the go-to thing would be to say, well, let's figure out what the FRO would be for accelerating the field of antibiotics discovery. And then it's a big ticket item compared to, to many things. But for some of the larger scale philanthropists out there, tens of millions of dollars is, is not a completely unreasonable amount to spend. You might spend that much on having a, a building or something. And how about instead just nail uh, antibiotics discovery platforms or something like that. That would be on the philanthropic side. On the government side, well, there there are multiple potential governments, but on you know on the on the U.S. government side, what we what we wrote in this white paper that we're sort of circulating in the policy community through this entity called the Day One Project. Day One referring to the first day of a new presidential administration. The idea there is there's there's an entity called the Office of Science and Technology Policy, which is part of the White House, and it helps to kind of coordinate the priorities that the president and the White House have with what the individual agencies like the National Institutes of Health or, or the Department of Energy are doing. And so I think the perhaps an ideal outcome on the government side would be an OSTP coordinated initiative where the multiple different agencies each have their own, if you want, interpretation of how to push more research into these kinds of concerted moonshot projects. Uh, you could therefore have FROs in multiple domains that way. So going way, way back, <laughs> I, mean, I kind of want to go to your, your, your PhD, but um, I'm, I'm just curious to go back even further. Tell us about you know your childhood. Where did you grow up? Were you already interested in science or did that come later? Yeah, I, so I grew up in Western Massachusetts, and as a young kid, you know, I wasn't necessarily the most scientific. I, you know, I had some of my elementary school co- colleagues were much more scientific or in, advanced than I was. I was doing a bunch of sports, karate and gymnastics and horse riding, and eventually got really into gymnastics for a while. But my dad 
had a, a telescope. He was he was an amateur. He was an economist, but an amateur astronomer. So I got exposed to astronomy that way. So I knew that was cool. And I had supportive parents that would, would buy books and stuff for me. So I'd sometimes end up in, in the Barnes and Noble. I don't know what you have local local to you but bar- when i was a kid the barnes and noble bookstore was where you would you we are where you go and i sort of used it as a library because you could basically read stuff that was on the shelf so i would go to the science section of barnes and noble which presumably was a consequence of my dad helping me get excited about both stars galaxies and robots or so on so that seemed like the natural place to go and eventually in doing that i stumbled across books that got me interested enough one was about nanotechnology and sort of introduced me to the idea that you could have general purpose technologies that would very broadly impact, you know, multiple key areas of human life. Do you remember the title of the book? Oh, that was uh, Drexler's book on engines of creation. That that was one of my formative books too, actually. That's awesome. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's funny. Yeah. You know how it doesn't necessarily have to be a successful academic field, you know, for something to be tr- absolutely transformational for, for generations of people. So that, that was one, there was another popular science book uh, at the time that I was a kid called the elegant universe uh, by Brian Greene, which was about string theory and cosmology. So between those two, I knew that both that there was um, a lot of cool things you could do with biotech and a component to getting at that through physics. And so that sort of set, my path. So eventually I, the gymnastics was taking too much time away from my reading physics books. (laughs) I eventually got to the Feynman books and stuff. And so once, once, once gymnastics was in the way of the physics books, then it was clear what the choice was. Yeah. Great. And maybe we can uh, jump forward several years. Tell us about what you did during your PhD. Well, PhD was a pretty crazy ride because I had a, a high freedom graduate program called the biophysics program uh, at Harvard, which was really a kind of wild card where you could basically work in, in any department or lab in the kind of broader biomedical sphere at both Harvard and MIT. It's kind of a maybe un- underappreciated program and how much freedom it gives you. And then I ended up with a very high freedom advisor, George Church, who is, first of all, very creative and open-minded, but second of all, you know, has... I don't know, 50 to 100 people in the lab at any given time. So I had a lot of freedom there. And I also ended up with a high freedom fellowship. So I really, they have this phrase, phrase enough rope to hang yourself. And I, I definitely had that, you know, many times over. So as a result, basically as a PhD student, I was trying to pursue somewhat perhaps unrealistic uh, moonshot projects, m- very much of the nature of what we're now trying to do with FROs. And it was only along the way that we managed to like publish, you know, a few kind of basic papers to 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 actually do the PhD, but I started out interested mostly in biomolecular self assembly and trying to make these so called DNA origami structures, which which self assemble um, in a programmable way. I wanted to make those much bigger so that we could integrate those onto silicon chips and make a kind of biochip that would have nanometer to centimeter levels of of control all the way on a single platform. You know, that one, I think we we made a little bit of progress. We did make some unusually large DNA origami. But I also realized somewhere in the middle of that that I didn't have a very clear path of what the applications would really be of that. So I midway through, I sort of switched to, to neuroscience and had also a very unambitious goal of trying to record simultaneously all neurons in the mouse brain, which uh, in the church lab, which was mostly focused on DNA-based technologies, the natural way to think about doing that was to try to record neural activity into DNA molecules inside each cell. So we did a lot of ideation and kind of team building around that, a little bit of preliminary experiments where we were exploring whether you can get these DNA polymerases, which which copy DNA to encode information about the ion concentrations in their environment, which would be reflective of neural activity into patterns of errors in copying DNA. And then we sort of branched out from there, both to collaborating with a number of other labs on applications of DNA barcoding and DNA encodings to structural brain mapping, and on trying to understand more from a physics perspective, a a number of different ways you could record neural activity at super large scale including but not limited to these kinds of molecular methods. 
So that was a pretty weird PhD. <laughs> um, but it definitely was the breeding ground for thinking about these kinds of focused research organizations and what would it actually take to properly execute on some of those ideas that as a grad student, um, you know, I was nowhere close to being able to do on my own or with, you know, a few people I was collaborating with. So. And somehow in the middle of all that, you co-founded BioBright, yeah? Yeah. Well, I, I met another person who was interning in the church lab at the time named Charles Fracchia. And one way to put it, maybe unflatteringly to both of us, is that ne neither of us were that great at wet lab experimentation. <laughs> uh, Charles was maybe a little better than I was. Um, he had had an undergrad in biology and mine was in theoretical physics. But we were interested in whether there was a way to make it easier to keep track of what was going on in, in your, your wet lab experiments. And the, there was a popular and exciting notion just kind of emerging around that same time of cloud labs. What if you were to basically have a web interface to an external lab that would do the, the experiments for you um, with companies like Emerald and Transcriptic popping up? And our feeling was that that was part of the story, but the other part of the story would be how do you augment the scientist in situ in their own lab and make it easier for them to take notes about what's happening and to compare what happened in the experiment to what the, the protocol should have been, or even simply to gather and centralize data from all the different experiments and equipment in the lab into a central way of looking at what was happening. So eventually Charles did some more work on this in the MIT Media Lab as a master's student and then went off and became CEO of this company. And, you know, I was a co-founder and helped it get some, some grant funding and recruit some initial people. Um, but Charles has really been leading the, the charge on that. And that has ev just evolved a lot by interactions with customers and, and contracts and, and understanding what different commercial entities need in terms of tracking and analysis of their experiments. Um, but that's also been a really interesting thing to see happen. Yeah. And so after you finished your PhD, you went to work with Ed Boyden at MIT. Can you tell us about what you did there? I developed a lot of ideas around these issues of large scale brain mapping in, in the PhD, as I mentioned, the idea there was that teaming up with Ed and others, we could increase the scale beyond individual experiments that, that I was, I was doing. And so how can we launch larger initiatives and projects? It's just sort of, you sort of seeing the line from where, where I was towards doing focused research organizations. This is where we, we started to, to think about how to move in that direction. Um, so a lot of the work I was doing with Ed, I wasn't doing experiments in the lab, but I was doing a lot of grant writing and a lot of coordinating of teams and developing strategies and collaborations to try to particularly develop some of these next generation structural brain mapping methods. And the, the main, the main thing that was exciting at the time and con continues to be really exciting to me is in 2014 or so between the church lab and Tony Zador's lab at Cold Spring Harbor, which had been leading the development of these so-called DNA barcodes for identifying individual neurons in the brain. And with Ed having some input into that as well, we were thinking about sort of how do you combine all these pieces together into, into an ultimate brain mapping technology and for sort of structural and molecular end of brain mapping, not for the, the living state. It seemed really promising, but there was this one missing piece, which is that you have to do really fancy microscopy in order to make this work. You'd have to slice the tissue really thin and it was just challenging. And the church lab had just come out with this idea of fluorescent in situ sequencing, which was kind of working, but it was it's a bit hard to get it working in actual in, intact slices of tissue as opposed to just cultured cells. The tissue processing and the microscopy were just hard. But, you know, Ed at the time sort of took me into his office and said, you know, we have this cool thing that we've been working on, which is a new way of doing microscopy that solves all the problems that you've identified. And I was like, wow, that's pretty crazy. And so what, and this was this expansion microscopy thing where you physically swell the brain tissue with the hydrogel to move the molecules apart from each other. 
in an isotropic uniform fashion. I like everyone in the neuroscience world did a uh, journal club on that. Yeah. And so, you know, what we were trying to launch, maybe we were a little ahead of ourselves. We were, we were trying to launch big initiatives to move this into really developing a, a strategy and, and workflow for, for doing a very integrated form of brain mapping. In practice, it took several years just to be able to get any kind of grants at all about this, for example, because it just seems so crazy to people, um, even though they, they had done a really great job in validating this. So it took some time just to gain kind of basic acceptance by the community and, and, and what we ended up, I think, accomplishing. And, you know, Ed's lab and collaborators with me kind of helping coordinate a bit of it. What they ended up accomplishing is really demonstrating a bunch of different ways in which this can be used, including so-called double expansion or iterative expansion, where you can expand twice and get 20-fold expansion instead of four-fold expansion. This integration of the chemistry of the in-situ sequencing or physique, so-called multiplexing methods with the expansion, which is um, now in a preprint and bioarchive and going to be published pretty soon expansion microscopy where you're staining the lipids much in the way you would stain with the electron microscope to kind of make it more relevant for connectomic brain mapping in the more traditional sense. And we also did sort of just pushed forward a bunch of other ideas, including a still theoretical approach to how you do single molecule protein sequencing, a bunch of things that sort of related to microscopy and molecular multiplexing. And it was a really amazing time with lots of people just seeing a lot of possibilities emerge. And after that, you went to work with Brian Johnson at Kernel, yeah? That's right. Seeing the difficulty at the time of having anything quite close to a focused research organization for this brain mapping, I decided that maybe my best bet would be to use that same strategic kind of road mapping approach that I've applied to these different areas and and try to push it in the context where we really did have a, a very scalable team that was commercial driven, but also thinking long term because Brian Johnson had been making a big commitment of his his own funds and his own time to run Kernel. And at the, at the same time, uh, Elon Musk was starting Neuralink. I had some discussions with those people as well. And there was kind of this burgeoning brain interface kind of mini industrial <laughs> boom uh, around late 2016. All of a sudden, people were like, we should start gigantic brain computer interface companies, <laughs> whereas they hadn't been saying that before, weirdly. So Kernel was a great experience, and we basically went through and, and tried to figure out all the possible things that Kernel could do, ranging from deeply invasive uh, medical devices to super next-gen physics of how you would do non-invasive things, and then sort of met in the middle with what they're doing now, which is a set of relatively practical but still quite new approaches to non-invasive brain activity mapping headsets basically. Um, and they've recently released a headset that does what's called functional near infrared spectroscopy, FNIRS, which is an optical way of measuring brain activity. Uh, they've basically released a much faster, cheaper, better, more portable FNIRS headset and are starting to give that to a bunch of collaborators to discover what can you actually do with that? Can you decode you know, speech? Can you decode mental imagery? Can you use it to tr help train AI? Can you use it to detect if a patient with a coma is is conscious, you know, a bunch of different things. If you have more accessible imaging technology that you can potentially do. And yeah, it's super exciting to see that progress. And then you went to DeepMind. I don't know how much you can tell us about that. Yeah. Yeah. DeepMind was cool. I was on the neuroscience team. That was, that was a, a really great experience. Basically at the point where Kernel identified its product direction, my crazy um, scientific road mapping, I think, was a little bit less relevant. And so I, I chose to let them push on the commercial execution of that and the engineering of that, which is not really my my strength, but is definitely the strength of some other people they have there, and scratch my AI itch. Because, you know, in, in all of this time, just thinking about how brain circuits, how we could map brain circuits or brain activity, I had, of course, been reading a huge amount about the neuroscience literature and what do people think these things actually do? <laughs> What's the actual functional interpretation of brain circuits? So that's what I tried to learn about in the time that I spent at DeepMind, which was amazing. I was on the neuroscience team there and we explored a bunch of ideas, a lot of them having to do with how memory works. 
And there on the AI side, it's not directly possible to connect it to circuits yet. You know, so there's nothing we can say, well, hey, we mapped this thing over here with in-situ sequencing or electron microscopy, and, and then here's the AI algorithm. Although we, you know, I spent a lot of time learning about exactly how close we are or are not to that in different systems. And there are some systems where it's much closer, like the way that the songbird does reinforcement learning for learning how to sing its song. That is something where we have both a kind of algorithmic understanding and a circuit understanding. Some of the higher level questions about how to get memory to work kind of have a, a flexible way of accessing working memory and short term memory in the, much the way we the way we think about thinking is sort of I remembered this and I, I combined this idea with that idea in, in some compositional way. It seems to rely on having memory buffers, basically. And we were thinking a lot about how that works in a way that's inspired by what we know about neuroscience, but it's still a little bit loose. But it was really cool. I got to learn about how AI researchers think and write a bunch of AI code to try to test out these types of models of how memory might work. It's a completely different perspective than conventional kind of circuit neuroscience. But I think that I remain super optimistic, actually, that these things are going to converge. But of course, it might take some time. <laughs> yeah. In what areas of science and technology are you most excited about? Uh, do, do you expect might have the highest likelihood of affecting a major transformation to, to people's lives and, and society? Lots of them. Lots of them. Yeah, I'm excited about a number. I would say that, you know, with my in initial push on nanotechnology as a teenager, right, as I was mentioning, like, I still want to see a path to make that work. <laughs> I see that still as having sort of fallen behind biotech, lots of things we want to do with a material world, we can do either with chemistry or with biology right now. And so sort of general purpose, atomically precise fabrication, I think is one of these things that is, is really great, but it's, it has a limited foothold in what the research community is doing right now to actually bootstrap to that. So, so in terms of things that seem like on the cusp of really exciting developments and that I'm like particularly interested in looking at with focused research organizations, I mean, I would point to a few. One is aging and age-related diseases. And I think the aging field is really starting to take off. You, you can always debate this. Have we actually understood anything fundamental about how, how aging happens? And until you see results in humans, you know, extending a mouse lifespan could mean something completely different. You know, mice die of very different reasons than humans do. Mice apparently mostly die from getting cancer. Um, there's not as, as much, let's say, heart disease or various other things or Alzheimer's or things like that. But I'm really interested in the idea that we can, including with animal models, identify common root fundamental drivers of, of age-related diseases. I'm really interested also in neuropsychiatric diseases where many pharma companies have basically killed their, their neuro uh, R&D divisions. But I'm optimistic that some of the brain mapping and proteomics and related types of technologies we've been thinking about now for, for years can circle back and tell you more mechanistic insights with what's going on with brain diseases. I'm weirdly really interested in geothermal energy these days as a possibly underappreciated source of clean energy that requires its own moonshot to figure out how to drill deep in the earth. I'm interested a bit in applications of AI to things, sort of social technologies and, and discourse. Can you make recommender systems that would be more genuinely helpful to people rather than just recommending what you will be most likely to click on? Can you recommend what will be most helpful to you as judged, you know, a month later or a year later? Or can you use that to sort of do fact checking or, or improve people's reasoning ability? with all these, these new uh, AI-based kind of natural language and prediction technologies. So, I mean, I'm just excited about so many things and that, that's, that's why I'm trying to focus on organizational enablement right now. It's partly means I don't have to choose one. So since you've been investigating these areas, can you maybe give kind of a, the take-home points of your understanding of where the aging field is today, what we know, what we don't know, what maybe we think we know that we may not actually know. <laughs> mm, I can try, <laughs> but it's a, it, that's a, that's a hard one, but I can try. 
I mean, I think there was there was maybe a basis many, many decades ago for things to be kind of exciting just in the realization that different species age at, at very different rates. You have things like naked mole rats, you know, that are seeming somewhat similar to other rodents and yet, you know, live much longer. Things got started to get exciting when people like Cynthia Kenyon were doing genetic screens in C. elegans where they could assay for, for lifespan and they could identify genes in a somewhat random way that would have a dramatic effect on the C. elegans lifespan just empirically. And then that started to hone in on a kind of axis of metabolic regulation of sort of how, how much are cells doing something like repair, if you will, versus how much are they just consuming as much as they can and growing as fast as they can. So sort of growth versus versus repair. And that axis and things like rapamycin and metformin and stuff sort of emerged on that axis. That's That was one stage. And then I think there's been a, a more recent stage that in some significant part comes out of both this revolution in induced pluripotent stem cells and Yamanaka's uh, Nobel Prize from work that I think was done around 2006 era, whereby you can, by dumping a few transcription factors on differentiated and aged cells, you can quote unquote reprogram them back to a, a pluripotent state, but also one in which a number of aspects of their physiology seem to revert back to a, a younger configuration. For cells in a dish, this was already exciting. One of the things that they measured in that Yamanaka paper was DNA methylation. And they said, look, we know that as cells differentiate, their methylation patterns change. And look, this procedure has actually reversed that methylation change. And perhaps partly as a result of that or just as a result of the growth of DNA array technologies and sequencing technologies, Others have started to develop these ideas of epigenetic clocks um, that measure aspects of the rate of aging that seem to be somehow related to this differentiation versus uh, reprogramming spectrum. In that same era, there was also the discovery of, if you want, non-cell autonomous or sort of circulating factors that operate in the blood that seem to, in a way that it's not clear how exactly it relates to this metabolic access of the, the first Kenyan kind of discoveries, but in some as yet not very well understood way, it seems to restore the kind of regenerative proliferative capacity of, of cells through circulating factors, for example, famously, if you take the blood from young mice and put them into old mice, but what is really going on there? And just in the past year or so, there have been a number of advances along that, including one from UC Berkeley, where they simply, rather than put blood of young mice, they simply dilute the blood of old mice. Um, and they just put back one protein called albumin and saline. And that seems to have some of the same effects, although this is just a sort of preliminary study. And another paper where they have a as yet undisclosed fraction of uh, young blood proteome, they put that into old rats and they measure a bunch in this case a bunch of physiology they measure methylation clocks and things like that and they see a, a bunch of seemingly kind of coordinated effects from these circulating factors so and meanwhile all of these lines have proliferated and, and developed and there have been a number of different compounds discovered that have some kind of effect in enhancing uh, you know, re regeneration or blocking cellular uh, killing senescent cells understanding the interactions between how things like senescent cells drive systemic inflammation and how inflammation can in turn cause a bunch of other aspects of aging related problems like you know atherosclerotic uh, heart disease and things like that so i think there's a, a lot of progress in understanding this the physiology of different different levers it's still not a unified picture where you can completely say you know these are the core drivers versus these are the effects and there's a so-called set of hallmarks of aging. And at the same time, there was this, uh, another paper about the pillars of aging, each of which I think identified eight or nine different underlying features. But none of those are completely understood. What, you know, is that really the right list of seven? Could you, par could you instead parcelate that in a different way that would reflect cause and effect more closely? That's still not really known. But I think it's a great time to push towards um, 
these concerted FRO style moonshots to really measure everything about what's happening in those processes. You can never really measure everything, but to, to have a really systematic kind of genome project style attack on, on understanding how each one of these levers affects all of the others for a more like data-driven hallmarks of aging. It's really exciting. So, so I love the optimism here. Um, <laughs> I'm a big fan of that. I'm wondering if, you know, before we wrap up, if we could change, change tack a bit and, you know, as you, as you think about these various scientific and technological moonshots, what do you think is the greatest realistic dystopian threat that could come out of this and what can we do to mitigate it? Yeah. Um, I spent some time, I'm not an, really an expert on this, but I spent some time trying to ascertain like what are people thinking about more versus less in these areas. And, you know, I think sometimes the there's there's a lot of emphasis on on risks from artificial intelligence. And in particular, sometimes people say that if you do neuro inspired AI, um, that would actually be even more risky because if you if you sort of try to copy the brain for AI, it it will be harder to prove theorems about that and basically prove bounds of of sort of controllability or correctness because you you you'd never derived it from from math in the first place. You're just taking kind of heuristic hints and then seeing what happens. I'm not sure I agree with that. I think that potentially if the brain may have some understandable, relatively unified set of learning principles that it uses, and that if we actually understand that better, we may be able to design AI safety, so-called AI alignment kind of mechanisms that are actually just more reflective of how the algorithm actually works. It doesn't have to be totally inscrutable. I also think that there's potentially some software engineering ways that you can make re really capable AI systems that are not agents in this in the sense of optimizing some single objective function that you're worried about getting out of control but rather just a very tightly sort of supervised sets of processes that are that are more like you know microsoft word than they are a, a person i think there's a lot to be understood there broadening out the research in ai safety i generally feel that um yeah, you know, the obvious one is pandemics, <laughs> um, you know, and both natural and, and engineered. And I, I think we need to have a kind of ubiquitous DNA sequencing uh, everywhere. And apparently it's actually possible to see um, so-called viral chatter. So if, if a virus is starting to make its way to the point where it could start spreading in the human population, be before that happens, you would start to see in patient samples, just a little bit of an uptake of this virus. So even if you aren't going and sequencing the rivers, you know, or something like that, you if you're just sequencing people that come in for primary care, physical or whatever, if you're just sequencing the population, you, you should be possible to track the emergence of viral pathogens. But I don't think we have anything like that in place, let alone globally, to be able to anticipate we should also have something like ready-made vaccine candidates for each of the 20 or so major categories of viruses so that you really know whether an mRNA or a peptide or what is going to work. And maybe you have to customize it a little bit. So I, th I think that we are still very underprepared for biological risks and hazards. And then I think we're very sociologically at risk of mass scale misunderstanding <laughs> and vindictiveness uh, as we see playing out on the internet. And I hope that particularly AI technologies can be used to actually sort of mitigate some of that rather than amplify it. But right now it might be on, on balance just by optimizing for sort of attention or engagement. It might be on balance, actually increasing our infighting of humans <laughs> that need to be focused on uh, moving forward as a species. Yeah. Well, I think that's still overall a relatively optimistic answer to a uh, disturbing question. So unfortunately we're out of time. I wish, <laughs> I wish we had more, but um, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks a lot for this very wide ranging um, and thought provoking discussion, Grant. Yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate uh, you coming on. Thanks, Adam.